Okay. Next Thursday, we'll have uh, the first midterm exam. Okay? I know it might come as a surprise to some of you. I hope not. All the information is now available on vSpace and also on my, um, on my homepage. But there are links between them anyway. So where you can find all the information on, on, at either place. And on Tuesday, we'll have a review lecture. So you, will be welcome, you are welcome to ask me questions on Tuesday about the material. The material for the midterm exam is everything up to this week. Okay? Everything we've studied up to this week. So next week we'll have review both in sections and in my, in my Tuesday lecture. And then on Thursday we'll have the exam right here. Now, I uh, requested a, a, another room to, so that we have a little bit more space. But unfortunately, uh, it, it, it looks like uh, no rooms are available. So we'll just have to use this one, um, utilize this as much as we can. So the, in a way, it's, it makes things easier. So you don't have to, we don't have to split into two groups. We'll all be here. So the exam will be just in the usual class time. We'll start sharp at 3.40, and we'll, we'll finish at 5, right here. Any questions? Yes? No, but all questions like that are addressed on, uh, on that. So I, I don't want to waste too much time describing this, because uh, I believe that all the information is available. All right. And in the meantime, um, I want to go back to, to the topic which we started discussing last time. Thanks. The topic which we started discussing last time, namely the differentials. And already last time, I, um, I talked about the differentials in the case of functions in one variable. I would like to repeat that now and then talk about differentials of functions in two variables. First one variable case. So in the case of one variable, we'll have a function f of x. And we'll have a graph of this function. The graph of this function lives on the plane where, in addition to our variable x, we introduce one more variable, which is responsible for the values of the function. And usually, usually we denote this, let, this second variable by y. But I would like to so sort of to uh, depart from this tradition today and use a different different labeling for the second coordinate because after this I will talk about functions in two variables where x and y will be two independent uh, arguments, two independent variables of the function. And so I, would, I don't want to have uh, any confusion between this variable here in the case of function in one variable and the second variable for functions in two variables. So that's why what I want to do is I want to call it z. Then it will be more close to what will happen for functions in two variables, because for functions in two variables, we'll have x and y, two independent variables, and then z will be responsible for the values, right? So x and z, and uh, as I said already many times, um, we don't have to use uh, x, y, or x, z. You, you, in principle, each time you can use any letters you like. It's just a tradition to use x and y. But might as well today use x and z, because then we'll be able to appreciate the analogy between the one-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case more. So the graph of this function, then, will be given by the equation z equals f of x. This will be the graph of this function of f of x on the, on the zx, zx plane. And so let's say... Let's say this is a graph. Now we pick a point, x0. This is a particular value of, uh, of x. It could be any number, any real number you like. And what we are interested in is we are interested in the tangent line. Interested in the tangent line to this graph at this point. That's a tangent line. Right? 
So what's so special about the tangent line? We've talked about this many times before. The special thing about tangent line is, well, there are two special things. First of all, it's a line. And a line is the simplest curve, right? It's given by the simplest possible equations amongst all curves. And just geometrically, it is, it is the simplest curve that you can draw. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that among all lines which pass through this point, which pass through this particular point, this red line approximates the graph in the best possible way in the small neighborhood of this point. In other words, I'm not claiming that this, this line is a good approximation to the graph everywhere. Certainly it's not. They diverge. The farther away we get from this point. They diverge more the farther, the farther we get away from this point. But just in a small neighborhood of this point, it is actually a very good approximation. And in fact, when I draw it, I, it it's kind of difficult to draw it in such a way that actually to, to, to insist that they're actually different because so, they're so close to each other. That already gives you the feeling that indeed that it's a very good approximation. So that's what tangent lines are good for. They give you linear approximation to your function. In other words, they, uh, they capture the, 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 essential, the essentials of the behavior of this function in a small neighborhood of this point to the first order, as we say, which already contains a lot of information. So therefore, it is useful to write down the equation for this, the equation for this tangent line or more precisely, to think of this tangent line as a graph of a linear function. And so what is, what is this linear function? Well, we know that since the studies of uh, one variable calculus, we know that the slope of this tangent line is given by the derivative of this function. So the tangent of this angle theta right here is actually f prime of x0, right? And so the equation of the equation of the tangent line, and I'll just oh, let's just write it in words of the tangent line. At x equals zero is the following. Y is, equal, sorry, I see I'm writing Y because I'm used to writing Y, but uh, like I said, I want to use Z. Z is equal to F prime of X zero times X minus X zero plus Z zero. What is Z zero? Z zero is the value of the function at this point. And so Z zero, of course, is just F of X zero. But I, pref I could actually write here f of x, x0 also. But I prefer to write at z0 to kind of to make a notation a little bit less heavy. And I want to re rewrite this also as follows. As z minus z0 is equal to f prime of x0 times x minus x0. I want to emphasize that this is a particular number. This is a particular number. This is a number, namely the slope. And it appears in this formula as a coefficient of proportionality between the increment in z along this line and the increment in x along this line. So the increments, increments in z and x are proportional. That's what this formula express. That's what this formula expresses. Proportional to each other, and the coefficient of proportionality is nothing but the derivative of f at this point. Okay. So it's important to realize that all of this, everything that I've done so far, is relative to a particular point x zero. Is relative to x zero. If I choose a different point, let's say some x1, okay, so this will this point will live here. On the, I mean this, the point with with such x coordinate will live here on the graph, and so the tangent line to this point will be will be this blue line passing through this point, 
And surely this blue line has nothing to do with this red line. And for a good reason. Tangent line is useful as much as we want to understand the behavior of the function in the neighborhood of that point to which we draw the tangent line. So the tangent line becomes irrelevant when we start talking about a point which lies sufficiently far away. You see? So when you talk about tangent lines, you have to specify the reference point, the initial point. Tangent line at what point? There is no such thing as tangent line, the tangent line to, to a graph. There is a tangent line. There is tangent line for each point, for each point on the graph. That's the, most, that's the first important thing that you have to remember. And then once you fix x0, your reference point, or more precisely, your reference point on the if you look at it on the plane, it's x0 and z0, where z0 is the value of the function at x0. Once you have that, then you have the equation for this tangent line. And sure enough, it involves the equation x0 in a very essential way. It involves it in two places. First of all, the increment in x is counted relative to x0. And second of all, the coefficient of proportionality is the derivative of f at this point x0. So surely this coefficient, the slope, will be different for a different point. And you can see that the slope of the blue line is different from the slope of the red line. So this formula really refers to the red line. So this one. OK. So now um, the concept of the, the, the differential, the concept of differential is just the concept of, of this equation that we have written, of this equation which expresses the proportionality of, um, of the increments in the value, in the argument of the function, the value of the function uh, under linear approximation. So the notation, so, so the, the, the important thing to understand about the differential is that it's a particular, it, it revolves around a particular choice of notation for the increments, which I'm now going to explain. So the, all the difficulties in understanding the differential, in my view, really boil down to understanding the notation. That's why I'm going to be very careful when I define this notation. Okay. So we'll introduce the following notation. I would like to denote x minus x0, I would like to denote x minus x0 as dx. This is just a notation. And so I want to emphasize, for, by definition, so I define this to be just the difference between x and x0. Now, if I write it like this, you already see that this notation is deficient because on the right, this expression depends on the choice of x0. Right? When I write x minus x0, it depends on the choice of x0. If x0 is equal to 0, this will be just x. If x0 is 1, this will be x minus 1. If x0 is 2, it will be x minus 2, and so on. If it's you know, pi, it will be x minus pi. In other words, on the right-hand side, it's not, I'm not talking about a single function in x. But it's a function which uh, you get, it's a linear function, it's very simple, but it's a function which you only get, which you only specify once you specify x0. But my notation on the left does not carry x0. So that's the, that is the, the first major problem in, in the notation which we use. So let me cure that by actually introducing it explicitly on the left-hand side. So I will actually, I will keep track of x0 by putting it as an index, as an index. Uh, in this notation. So it, and to emphasize that this is something that we are doing for now and we will actually discard later on, I will, I will put it in yellow. So let me just introduce notation dx relative to x0. I will just denote the following linear function x minus x0. I have the right to do this. I can introduce any notation I like. Right? So this is notation I want to introduce for whatever reason. Likewise, for z, I want to do the same. dz also relative to x0, I would like to write as z minus z0. Maybe it's better to say relative to z0, but z0, of course, is determined, this one, when, since we are talking about a particular function f, z0 is determined by x0. So, so in fact, I could write as the 
parameter z x0 or z0, whatever I like. But let's write z0 to make it a little bit more consistent. This is actually determined by 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 z by x0. All right. So and that's just going to be z minus z0. So so far it's to, to, totally tautological, totally tautological. There is nothing in this. It's just a choice of notation. But if I do that, then I can rewrite this formula in the following way. Just this formula. On, on the left-hand side, I recognize what I now call dz relative to z0. And on the right-hand side, I recognize dx relative to x0. So the same formula will look like this. dz relative to z0 is equal to f prime of x0 times dx. So, so I've done nothing. I've just, uh, I've just used a certain notation for, um, just introduced some new notation for, uh, for z, uh, for the increment in x and z. But now the formula starts looking more familiar because you've seen this formula before in um, one, one variable calculus. But what's usually done is usually we drop, we drop the indices. So then it looks like this, dz is equal to f prime of x0 dx. And also we replace, often replace, dz by df. So we get df is equal to f prime. You see, so you recognize this formula, right? Because you can also use this to write f prime is equal to dx, df over dx. But now you understand, I, I hope you, understand, you can under, now appreciate this formula more and understand what, what, it, what it means. Uh, usually in a, you know, in a textbook, they don't really explain what do you mean by, what is meant by dx, what is meant by df, or dz, which we use here interchangeably because we are talking about particular function f for which z serves as the, as, the, as the value. The point is that dx and dz are nothing but the increments in the coordinate x and in the value z along the tangent line, along the tangent line. So the equation of the tangent line, which we know is given by this formula, just becomes the, the old formula that you knew, that dz is equal to f prime dx. Or, if you wish, df equals f prime times dx. You see, the only problem in understanding this formula is the fact that usually we, what, what we can call abuse notation, we abuse notation in a, in a sense that we drop some essential information from the formula. This would be, to me, a much more consistent way of expressing the fact that what we are doing is just writing down the formula, the equation for the tangent line. It is important, from the, at least from the outset, to indicate the fact that dx is not an absolute notion like x. x is sort of an absolute notion. It's a coordinate, right? So x makes sense without any reference to anything else. It's a particular coordinate. dx is not an absolute notion. It's a relative notion. dx is defined once you choose the reference point. Once you choose the reference point x0, then dx is defined, right? So, and then if the reference point is 0, dx is just x. Is if reference point is 1, it's x minus 1, and so on and so forth, right? It's just x minus x0. Likewise, dz is not an absolute notion. It is really relative, it is really relative to the reference point. Once you choose the reference point, it's just increment. And once you realize that, then you see that this formula is nothing but the expression of proportionality of the two increments along the tangent line, right? Which is just the equation of the tangent line. All right? Do you see what I mean by this? Do you, do you have any questions about this? I wouldn't, in a way, you can say, why am I talking about all of this? The, um, because we've, lear we've learned nothing new. What we, the only piece of impo essential information is already available here. That's the equation of the tangent line. Something we've known all along, well, all along since the one variable calculus, right? Since studying the one variable calculus. 
But the reason I explain this is because we are going to use this notation dx and df and dz, and I would like to explain what it really means. So now I have explained this, that this explained where this notation, what this notation means, and I've explained what the formula, the old formula that we've known, df equals f prime dx, means. Um, and it's just the equation of the tangent line. All right. Now, this expression, f prime of x dx, is called a differential. f prime x0 dx. And I would like to, to keep insisting on putting this x0 just to make sure that we understand that actually this is something which is relative. It's a relative notion is called the differential of the function f at the point x equals x0. So let me give you an example. Let's say f of x is x squared minus, uh, minus 3x, OK? What is the differential? What is the differential of this, uh, of this function, say, for x equals differential for x equals 1. Well, we simply have to take the derivative of this function. What is the derivative of this function? It is just 2x minus 3, right? Just have to take the derivative of this function at the point x equals 1. So this 1 is what I, u I indicate in other formulas by x0. This is x0. Now, right? So I substitute, I simply substitute this. I have to substitute x0 into this expression, like here. So I get 2 times 1 minus 3. So it's negative 1, right? And then I multiply it by dx relative to, relative to the point x0, which is, in our case, is 1, right? So in fact, I could also write it as ne minus 1, negative 1, times x minus 1, right? So the differential of this function is really this linear function, negative 1, times x minus 1, which is the same as, if you want, it's just uh, 1 minus x. But OK, so let's just, leave it, let's just leave it like this, minus x minus 1. You see, that's the differential of this function. But usually, what we're going to do is we're going to abuse the notation. I mean, from now on, once we understand what the meaning is, we will actually abuse the notation, and we will drop all the indices. Right? So when we drop all the indices, we will actually just write minus dx, and say this is a differential of this function at the point x equals 1. Right? We have to realize that actually in this formula, dx is referring to this particular point. Right? And if I change the point, I will get a different answer. So change the point. So let's find the differential for x equals 2. So now it's 2, which is a which is x0. Right? So I have to substitute this value into the derivative. So I substitute 2 here. I get 2 times 2 minus 3. So I get 1. Right? So now, now f prime of 2 is equal to 1, whereas here it was negative 1. Right? And so I'm going to get 1 times dx. at x0 equals 2, which is just, uh, well, I can just erase 1, of course, I mean, just dx. And then just in this case, we're going to just write dx, dropping the indices. So s suppose it's this yellow, yellow chalk becomes invisible. And so the answer just becomes dx. Right? But you have to realize that this is a differential at the point x equal 2. And it's different from the differential at the point x equal 1, which was negative dx. So what I'm saying is what I drew here on this diagram is that 
Well, the differential is the function whose graph is the tangent line. The tangent line depends on the choice of the point. So therefore, the differential also depends on the choice of the point. The coefficient, of, the coefficient in front of dx is going to be just the slope, which is a derivative. Here, a negative 1. Here, 1. right? But also, dx itself actually has a different meaning. Here, dx is x minus 1. And here, maybe I should write, here, it's uh, just x minus 2, really. OK? Yes? The differential is a function of x, which is equal to the f, which is equal to this. This is a differential. It's a function of x, which is equal to the derivative of your original function f at the point x0 times dx, which is understood as x minus x0. That's the differential. This is a this particular linear function. It is precisely the function whose graph is the tangent line. It's the equation of the tangent. It's a, fu it's a function which gives the tangent line. When you, s you cannot say tangent line is the function, right? You can say tangent line is the graph of a function. You see what I mean? I'm trying to be precise. I'm not, I, it's not because I want to be pedantic, but I, there is too much confusion as it is. So I, I try to separate different notions. There's a notion of a function. There's a notion of a graph of a function, right? So that's right. So a line, you cannot say tangent line is a function. Function is, some, is a rule which assigns to each number some number. You know, we represent a function by its graph. This tangent line is a graph of a function. Which function? The differential. Exactly. There is only one function given, which is f of x, but there is more than one tangent line. There is a tangent line for each point, which I have illustrated. I've drawn two of them. I've drawn the red one and the blue one, right? Yes? That's right. That's right. So you're right. So this is, that's right. So to be, pre to be absolutely precise here, the would be df for x0 equals 1 is equal to ne uh, m minus dx at x0 equals 1. df at x0 equals 2 is dx at x0 equals 2. And then if you want, I can also do df at x0 equals 3, for example. I just need to calculate the derivative at the point 3. The derivative at the point 3 is 2 times 3 minus 3, which is 3. Right? So then the answer will be 3 times dx at x0 equals 3, and so on. But of course, now you can kind of guess what this coefficient is. This coefficient is just 2x minus 3. So instead of writing an infinite list of answers for different values of x0, I just write, I just write the formula in one stroke. I just write one formula which is responsible for all of this. I just write df is equal to f prime of x dx. Yes. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, when you're, certain things are allowed when you become adults, right? I mean, so that's sort of the, <laughs> it's, it's the same, same reason. It's just to simplify things, but uh, it, it leads to incredible confusion, in my opinion. So that's why I'm trying to unravel the precise definition and then explain how do we actually arrive at the formula which you see in the book. And I, I agree, and in some sense, we should not be allowed. Or more precisely, we should be mindful of this. So whenever we see this formula, that's what we should see. We should see not a single formula, but a bunch of formulas which depend on x0, on the choice of x0. That this one formula is not just one equation, but it's a collection of equations. For each value of x0, for each value of x0, there's a formula which says that df relative to that x0 is f prime at that x0 times dx 
at that x0. And this formula is, is nothing but just saying z minus z0 equals f prime of x0 times x minus x0, which is the equation of the tangent line. But we write in one formula, we write down all equations for all tangent lines. That's what we do. You see? So that's the point. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to convey here. Okay? And that's why I give you examples. So, ah, so maybe in this case, I would actually want to write more precisely. In this particular case, I will write f prime of x. I have found it, right? I have found that f prime of x is 2x minus 3. So in fact, I will write df is 2x minus, df is 2x minus 3 times dx. So more precisely, it is this formula which is responsible for all of this. Because if you have this formula, you will get this one if you substitute instead of x, you substitute value 1. Right? If you substitute 1, you get minus, like I put. If at x equal 2, you will get 1. At x equal 3, you will get 3, and so on. Right? So this one formula will give you all of them. In other words, I give you this formula, you should be able to substitute any value x0, and you will get the equation of the tangent line at that x0. Does it make sense? Any other questions? OK. So there is no, nothing mysterious about the differential. The only mysterious thing is that it, is, it should actually be defined relative to a particular point x0. And what we have done, or people before us have done, is that at some point they decide to drop this from the notation. So the formula starts looking like this, and starts looking very confusing, because what does it mean? What is df? What is dx? It becomes very, very confusing. But if you remember that it actually refers to a particular value x0, and once you remember that, you, you know that dx corresponds to x minus x0 and df corresponds to z minus z0, then the mystery disappears. There's no mystery. It becomes an extremely simple and mundane formula, just the formula for, for the tangent line, the equation for the tangent line. That's what it is. OK. So one more, one more piece of notation to, to sort of finish with this. We can also write delta f. So that's sort of to make things even more, more confusing, there is also notation delta f. Okay. And delta f, and again to be precise, we also have to say that it is relative to some x0. This by definition is f of x plus x0 minus f of x. So it is the increment of the actual function. It is the increment of the actual function, whereas df, df is the increment of the tangent line, of the linear function which approximates our function, you see. So that's the difference between this big delta and small d. So should not, this should not be confused, not be confused. with df relative to the point x0, which is f prime of x0 times x minus x. And let me draw again the picture. Let me magnify. Actually, let me not draw the coordinate system, but let me magnify, blow up the small neighborhood of this point. So here is my... Here's my graph. And here's my tangent line. Here's my tangent line. So here is x0 somewhere. And here will be x, here will be, um, I am, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did, I wrote something correctly x minus x0, sorry, f of x minus x0. So there is x0 and there is x. Oh. <laughs> so now I'm trying to confuse you. I'm sorry, yeah. 
I was going to draw it on the picture anyway, so you were. So look, this is, the, this is delta F. You see what I mean? This is x0 and this is x. And x is very close to x0, OK? I can measure the value of the function itself, which is the yellow curve. The, I can measure the difference between the values of the function. That's this, right? Or I can, me I can measure the difference between the values of the linear approximation, the linear function, which corresponds to the tangent line. That's df. OK? You see what I mean? These are different because it doesn't quite go up to here. They, they start diverging. They start deviating from each other. But the punchline is that they are almost equal. The difference is negligible. The closer you get to this point, the closer x and x0 are, the smaller the difference is going to become. Right? That's the punchline. Which, which expresses the fact that linear approximation is useful in the following sense, that, the, the, that when you are very close to the point, your linear function, whose graph is a tangent line, is almost as good as the original function. In case, of course, your function is a nice one, like this, so it's, it's kind of a smooth function. And such functions for which this linear approximation works are called differentiable functions. And so the punchline of all of this discussion is the following, that there is a large class of functions, there is a large class of functions f, for which the difference between delta f and df is negligible. It's very small. Relative to, uh, it's, sort of, it's much smaller than the difference between x and x0. So we can actually um, ignore it when x is very close to x0. So the notation is different, but the point is that the two quantities for differentiable functions are very close, which is to say that a linear function, the function which gives you the tangent line, is a good approximation to the original function. Let me write this down. So function f f of x is called differentiable at x equal x0 if delta f at x0 is equal to df relative to x0 plus um, I promise you not to use epsilon, but let me use it anyway. So to indicate that it's something very small. Uh, but I will not use delta. So. Where epsilon of x goes to 0 as x goes to 0. So in other words, this piece is negligibly small. You see, because this already goes to 0. And this certainly goes to 0 when x goes to, sorry, when x goes to x0. So this goes faster than x minus x0. It goes to 0 faster than x minus x0. So this is, this is precisely what I indicated by that little, little, little def difference. Maybe let me point out this. This, this little piece, this, is what is epsilon of x times x minus x. It's a very little one. This tiny little piece is something that goes to 0 faster than x minus x0, because this already goes to 0. And this goes to 0. So it goes as a, as a square. It roughly goes as a square of x minus x0. So let me, um, let me unravel this for you. In 
other words, what we are saying that function is differentiable. That's the, that's the, that's the expression. If delta f is df plus this, so what is delta f? I explained that delta f is just f of x minus f of x zero. So let me just spell out what that formula means. Let me call it. Let me call this star. Okay. So formula star is just saying the following. This. And now I want to spell out what df at x0 is. And df at x0 is this, right? So it's f prime x0 times x minus x0 plus epsilon over x. Now, if you remember Taylor series, this gives you a good perspective on this formula. Do you remember Taylor series? OK. What? You don't want Taylor series? Uh, how about just the first two terms in Taylor series? Okay. I'm not, I will not ask you for more than that. In Taylor series, the idea was that the difference that f of x, the idea was that f of x is equal to f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0 plus 1 half f double prime x0 times x minus x0 squared, plus and so on, OK? So I just want to explain to you what, what we are doing now. We are just looking at the, at the first two terms of the Taylor series. We are just um, focusing on the first two terms of the Taylor series, because this one, this one term is this. OK, now it's on the left-hand side, but big deal. We can just rewrite it like this. Let's just take it to the other side. Right. So you see. This, this, two, this matches this. This term matches this. In the Taylor series, we then have all the higher derivatives and higher powers of x minus x0, square, second, third, and so on. And now, I have taken all of this stuff and just denoted it by this one expression. Because see, the main point is that the powers of x minus x0, which show up in this term and the next term, are 2, 3, 4, and so on. They are higher than 1. So I can, I can sort of chip off the first power, x minus x0. And what will remain, for example, here, it's like second power. So this will have, I just split x minus x0 squared into this and one more x minus x0. So in other words, this thing goes to 0 by itself. You see what I mean? What I'm doing roughly is. Let's take this term, 1 half f double prime of x0 times x minus x0 squared. What I'm doing is just I'm writing it like this. I mean, I've done nothing. I just wrote the square as a product. And after this, I take this piece and call it epsilon. So then what I get is epsilon times x minus x0. The point is that this guy by itself goes to 0, right? It goes by itself to 0 because this is finite. This is just some expression, for example, for the function which I had, uh, which was the first derivative was 2x minus 3, so the second derivative would be 2. So this is just some number, which is 2. And it's 1 half of 2, so it's just 1. But then there is x minus x0. x minus x0 is something that goes to 0 as x approaches x0. But in addition, I have one more power, x minus x0 because I started out with the second power. The only term for which this will not be the case is the first term. In the Taylor series, the first term will have x minus x0 to the power 1. And that's the one which I retain. And then everything else, I say everything else is really negligibly small compared to this term. So that's the idea. That's the main point of our calculation now. Before, we tried to write it as, a, as an infinite series, which involves all powers. Sorry, all derivatives of the function. It involves no derivative at all, the first derivative, the second derivative, and so on. What we are saying now is that how about let's just keep the constant term, which is f of x0, and let's keep the first derivative term, right, which is, gives rise to the linear term in x. Let's just keep this, and everything else we'll just put in a bag and call it epsilon of x times x minus x0. 
It's something very small times x minus x zero. So it's negligibly small compared to the first two terms. The special thing about the first two terms is that they give you a linear function, which is the function whose graph is a tangent line. Right? So writing down this formula means that you approximate your original function f of x by a linear function. By a linear function, this one, plus some really, really small, negligibly small uh, error term. That's what we've done. OK? Questions? Yes? That's right. So I'm talking about functions in one variable, right? Because I'm of, of the opinion that before you do complicated thing, you should start first with a simple thing. And this is a, function, a case of one variable. So I wanted to explain everything in excruciating detail for functions in one variable. So now we'll have to talk about functions in two variables, right? But the point is that everything is going to work in exactly the same way. And I believe that you first have to understand what happens for one variable. And only then you'll be able to fully understand what happens for functions in two variables. So let me explain now functions in two variables. What happens for functions in two variables? So what, should, what can I erase? I want to keep this. And um, I kind of want to keep everything. But <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me erase this. So now we have a function in two variables, x and y. So we have f of x, y. So see, aren't you glad I haven't used y in the previous you know, calculations? We had x and z. Now we have x, y, and z. Right? So now we're going to have a graph of this function, but in space. And that's going to be a surface. So let me try to draw this. I will draw it in a slightly different way than last time, because I think it will be a little bit more clear. But you tell me. Like this. I want to draw it like this. No. OK, like this. And now we have a point. And now I want to say that there are two curves here, which actually last time I drew them with, with red and blue, but OK, let's not worry about this. So this is one curve. And that's another curve. Ah, maybe I can do it like this. It's better like this. You see? Picasso is never satisfied, you know, with his drawings. OK, something like this. I think this is better. Do you see what I mean? It's a kind of a, it's a surface like this, but it's concave. Last time I drew it uh, convex like this, and now it's concave. I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit e easy, easier on the eyes, so to speak. So this, of course, all lives in three-dimensional three space. So there is a three-dimensional coordinate system, as usual, x, y, z. And this corresponds to a particular point with coordinates x, 0, and y, 0. You see? And now I want to draw the analog of the tangent line. So this yellow thing, this yellow thing is the analog of this uh, uh, of the curve, of the graph of the function. When I say yellow thing, I mean, of course, the whole thing. The surface, right? You see what I mean? OK? So now, before, I had a tangent line, because it was a curve. So for a curve, it makes sense to talk about a tangent line. But for a surface like this, it makes more sense to talk about the tangent plane. It is two-dimensional. So in your linear approximation, you should use a linear surface but not a curve, a, a, a linear surface, which is what we call a plane. So in fact, I brought something to illustrate it even more. 
So this should play the role. I, I tried to find a, a basketball in the math department, but <laughs> finding a, a basketball in the math department is like, well, you, you complete the sentence. It was difficult. So this is what I found. So this is the surface, and I just want to explain what the tangent plane is. The tangent plane is what is a plane, let's say if I, if I pick a point, if I pick a point, the tangent plane is a plane which, ta which is the closest plane to this, to this surface, right? So that's the first point, first point I want to make. And the second point I want to make is that tangent plane is going to change when you change the point of contact. If you're interested in the tangent plane at this particular point, that's the, that's the plane you have. But if you want at this one, that's it's going to be this one, right? So it's exactly the same thing as we had for curves, for tangent lines. Tangent line depends on the choice of the point. Okay? Now, let me draw this tangent line for you. So you see, to, to indicate the, to give sort of a sh more shape and volume, well, not volume, but really the um, two-dimensional aspect to this, I, perspective to this, I, um, I, drew these two, I, I drew these two curves. What are these curves? These are the curves, exactly the same curves that I drew last time. This is a curve of intersection. This is intersection with a plane with a plane which, which goes like this, which is parallel to, to, to the yz plane. So it's really the plane where we fix the x-coordinate, x equal x0. You will see that what I'm doing now is very similar to what I did last time, but there are, there are small differences. For example, the, the graph I was using was, con was convex in a different way. Also, instead of x0, y0, I use notation a, b, and so on. But otherwise, it's very similar to what I did last, uh, on Tuesday. Right? And, and so what I do is I can cut by a plane, a vertical plane like this. <clears throat> I can cut the graph by this vertical plane, a vertical plane which is parallel to yz. And that's the curve I get. This is a curve which lives on the, on this, on the, on the, on the graph, on the surface, on the vase, if you want. So this is like part, part of the vase, and this lives on the vase. And then there is a perpendicular one, which I get by cutting it by a plane which is par par parallel to the xz plane. That's this one. Um, the only thing is I, I confuse them, right? I think it's the, what I was trying to say is that this is this is the sorry this is this is the curve you get by cutting with a vertical one parallel to zy. And now this one is what I get by cutting with a plane parallel to xz. So this one, this curve, is intersection with the plane y equals y0. So the graph is complicated. The graph is a surface, but on this graph, for, for my point x0, y0, I have, I have drawn two curves, which in some sense are, which are perpendicular to each other. These are the curves of intersection of the graph with two natural planes, two vertical planes. One plane goes, is parallel to the blackboard, that's this one, and the other one is parallel to this one, which kind of has an angle too, which really, since I'm just giving it a three-dimensional perspective, but I'm drawing it like this. But in fact, you should think, you should realize that this, it's a plane per which should be perpendicular to the blackboard, this xz plane. Okay, so I get two curves. Now, curves is something I can handle because we now know everything but curves. We know everything about tangent lines to curves. So, so this, um, these two curves have tangent lines for sure, just like this curve has a tangent line at our point, right? So let me draw two tangent lines. One will be the tangent line to this curve of intersection, and the other one will be the tangent line to this, to this curve of intersection. I'm kind of trying to separate them a little bit. So, so that's why you, you see it as, if, as though there is some distance between them, but there shouldn't be, just to make it more visible. 
Okay? And now these two planes, these two lines, in fact, they span a plane, which looks like this. See, that's the plane which is kind of slightly under, underneath the, the graph. That's what I was illustrating when I put a vase here, right? And that would be the tangent plane. So on this tangent plane, I would have two lines. It's two lines, which are tangent to the intersection, to the, to the curves on the graph, which you get by intersecting with the vertical planes. You see what I mean? Is this, is this clear? That's right. It's a tangent to that particular point. Exactly. If I take a different point, it will change, right? So, because, you know, imagine that there is a sphere here. So that would be the tangent line. But if I take a different one, it will be like this. It will get tilted in a different way. But not just like this, but also, you know, like this. <laughs> in all possible ways, right? So everything I say is relative to a point, relative to a particular point, which I now call x0, y0. So what I need to do is I need to write down the equation for this tangent plane, just like I wrote down here the equation for this tangent line. Right? And then I will say that this tangent line approximates the graph in a very nice way if the function is differentiable. And the equation for this tangent plane will be called the differential of the function at this point. So it will be exactly parallel to what we did in the one variable case. Right? So the immediate task at hand is to write down the equation for the tangent plane. Right? Fortunately, we know everything we need to know about equations for planes. Right? And we are going to use it now. Because we have previously studied the question of writing down the equation of a plane when we know two vectors which belong to this plane, right? We know how to do it. First of all, we know that to write down the equation of a plane, we need to know a normal vector to the, to the plane as well as a point. Uh, well, surely we have a point. That's x0, y0. So we need a normal vector. And we could calculate the normal vector by taking cross product of these two vectors, which go along, which go along these two lines, right? And what are those two vectors? Those two vectors are the tangent vectors to those curves, which we can easily find from the one variable calculation. Right? That's what we're going to do now. So let me explain what, um, what the, uh, actually it would be more like this way, because it will be this, this way and this way. It will be towards in the direction of x and y, rather than in the direction of not in the direction, not in the opposite direction. So we want to write down the equation need to write equation for the tangent plane. to the graph at the point x0, y0, and z0, where, by the way, by the way, z0, of course, is, again, f of x0, y0. That's the value of the function. So what is the equation? We know that the equation is going to look like this, a times x minus x0 plus b y time minus y0 plus c times z minus z0 equals 0, where a, b, c should be a normal vector. And how do I find a normal vector? I take these two vectors, let's call them r1 and r2, and I take their cross product. See, so now you can actually you can apply the knowledge 
which we have acquired, which we have acquired earlier. Um, about equations for planes. Yeah, so now we can appreciate why, you know, why it was important to actually um, learn, the, lo learn the, these techniques, about uh, a technique about you know, uh, uh, planes and lines and so on, and, and cross products. So we have to figure out what R1 and R2 are. So let me talk about R1. But see, R1 is something which I find by using a curve. And this curve is obtained, I recall, by intersecting the graph with the plane y equals y0. In other words, is what I used to call, which I, what I called on Tuesday, freezing the second variable. Intersecting with this plane means that we freeze the second variable, y. y is fixed, it's y0. So effectively, the problem, which is three-dimensional, because we have x, y, and z, becomes two-dimensional, because only the unfrozen variables participate, namely x and z. So that's why now I'm going to draw that curve on the x and z plane. And it's going to look like this. Where is my yellow? Um, I lost my yellow joke. Oh, yes, I know. Here it is. Just for consistency, I want to draw it with yellow, OK? So it's going to look like this. Because I'm looking at it now from, the, from that angle, so that x goes this way and z goes this way, so that this curve, this is the curve I'm drawing, it is decreasing. That's why I draw it like this. And this is a tangent vector I'm interested in. This is my r1. It's going to be a tangent vector. So we have to find a formula for this R1, right? But we know how to find tangent vectors to parametric curves, right? How to do this? Well, first of all, what is this curve? This curve is z equals f of x, y, 0. We have frozen, we have frozen frozen y. We have, we have just set y equals y0. So this function, which, by the way, last time I used to indicate it by writing it in with red. So the function effectively becomes a function in one variable only, namely x. Right? Let me call this, let me call this g of x. Because the function in one variable only, so let's just call it g of x. So this is, this is a graph of the function z equals g of x. Right? This is, by the way, the same notation I used on Tuesday. OK. Now I want to convert this into parametric form, because we've learned how to do tangent vectors when we have parametric form. Right? So let's do parametric form. But for graphs, it's very easy. Parametric form is x equals t and z equals g of t. So I have this vector r of t, which is t g of t. That's the uh, vector valued function, which corresponds to this parametric curve. And now I know that this vector r, which is a tangent vector, r1, is just a derivative of this, right? It's just r prime f x 0. My point corresponds to t equals x 0 is our point. So this is a formula we've learned before, which now comes very useful, namely the formula for the tangent vector to a parametric curve. I have converted my curve into a parametric curve into variables with this parameterization. Right? And now I can use this. And what do I find? The first derivative is 1. right? This is a prime. The prime means derivative with respect to t. I'm just recalling. It's derivative with respect to the t variable. So derivative, the derivative of t is 1. And the derivative of g of t is g prime of t. But t is x0. So it's 
g prime over zero. But now remember, we agreed that the derivative of g uh, at x zero is the first partial derivative of f. Because that's how we define the first partial derivative, right? First partial derivative was defined by taking that function g, which we get by freezing y, and taking the derivative. So what this is, is just 1 and f sub x at x0, y0. This is, the, this is what I needed. I have found R1. Now, this is not exactly true, because R1 is a vector in three space, and now I have um, done the calculation in two space where I kind of ignored the y variable. But in fact, the y variable should be here. It's actually, it's not like this, but it's going into the blackboard to comply with the rule. So what I found is this vector in two space, but on the plane. But if I want the corresponding vector in three space, I have to also remember the y coordinate. And the y coordinate will be 0. So it will be in between these two. So the true vector r1, the true vector r1 in this formula is just is just 1, 0, and f sub x, x0, y0. Why like this? Because I found this guy is 1 and f, x, f sub x, but to have a true vector in three space, I also have to give it the third coordinate, which corresponds to y. This is a coordinate which corresponds to x, and this is a coordinate which corresponds to z. And I need one more which corresponds to y. But it is 0 because everything is happening on the plane which is perpendicular to the y axis. So that's r1. Now you need to calculate r2. And of course, you can guess what the answer is. Right? The point is that now 0 will, will migrate here because now um, everything will be happening on a different plane, which is the yz plane. So the x coordinate will have no role at all. The y coordinate will now play the role of x. So this will be 1, and this will be f sub y. It's exactly the same calculation, except I should draw it on the plane yz, and I should call it r2. And I should do the same parameterization and the same calculation, exactly the same. So I'm not doing it just to save time. So that's the answer I get. So we are almost there. Because now, all we need to do is to find a normal vector to our plane, which, as we already discussed, is a cross product. So finally, we get to use the cross, pro the, the, the cross product for something, for, something really, for something really important, right? So this is, this is our application of the, of the cross product. So R1, R2 is going to be, as we, dis as we discussed, and no doubt, some of you may have wondered, why the hell are we doing all this stuff, right? But now, you can appreciate, you can appreciate that, um, that it is actually important. I am just, uh, for shorthand, I'm not writing, I'm dropping x0, y0, but I will restore them later. So what is this? This is i times this, which is minus uh, fx times i, then minus j times fy, uh, fy times j, and then k, I just get this matrix, so it's 1 plus k. OK? Does everybody agree with this? We have found a normal vector to our plane. That's the one. So normal vectors perpendicular to this plane, or if you want, like this. So say this is R2, this is R1, and this is the, this is, this is the perpendicular vector, the normal vector. And that's it. We're done, because now we can write down the formula for the tangent plane. You see this? So 
the formula for the tangent plane becomes minus f sub x then you get minus f sub y plus z minus right and now I just want to rewrite this in a nicer way z minus z0 is equal to f sub x of x0 y0 times x minus x0 plus f sub y x0 y0 times y minus y0 that's the equation of the tangent plane and of course you should compare it to the equation of the I, I have erased it but I want to write it again in the one dimensional case the equation was f prime of x0 x minus x zero. So it's totally analogous. Right? Z minus z zero here was the derivative times x minus z, x zero. There was only one variable, therefore only one derivative. There was no choice. Now there are two different derivatives, and both of them show up. This is a derivative with respect to x, or partial derivative with respect to x, times the increment in x, and this is a partial derivative with respect to y, times the increment in y. So this is a linear function. The right-hand side is a linear function whose graph gives, gives you that tangent plane. And this function is called the differential of f at this point. Right? So more precisely, yes? No, oh, this is A, B, C. This is what I got. Then I wrote the equation of the, of the tangent plane over there by using this coefficient, these three coefficients. I mean, if you want, I put one here, but it's uh, We have two notation, two different choices, two notation for vectors. One is with i, j, k, and the other one with three components. When I have a vector, I call this a, b, c. If this is a normal vector, then the equation of the plane is a times x minus x zero plus b times x y minus y zero plus c times z minus z zero. This is what I wrote. Second formula from the bottom. Huh? You see that now? Yeah. The second formula from the bottom is the equation for the plane which is perpendicular to this vector. Right? OK. Any other questions? All right. So now, I'm all, we're almost there. And um, um, the, so the right-hand side now is called a differential. Right-hand side is called the differential differential of f x y at the point x zero y zero it is a linear function it is a linear function which approximates well our function provided that our function is differentiable in fact uh, f of x y is called differentiable at x0, y0, compared to the one-dimensional case, if I have delta f, which is well, let's just write, let's just write the formula. F, if f of x, y minus f of x0, y0 is equal to this linear function, up to a small correction term. So fx of x0, y0 times x minus x0. 
plus f sub y at x0, y0 times y minus y0. The correction term I will now write as sum of two terms. Before I had a correction term which was something small times x minus x0, but now I will write it uh, something small times x minus x0 plus something small times y minus y0. So if you, if you like, if you like to think in terms of Taylor series, you can imagine that I'm writing a Taylor series expansion for my function where I first write the constant term, then I find, write the linear term, which now has two summons, one coming from the first derivative partial derivative and the other coming from the second partial derivative. And then I will have quadratic terms and cubic terms which would involve all the mixed partial derivatives of higher order. But then actually I, I kind of, I don't want to specify them other than to say that, it, that they all together combined have this shape, something which is negligible compared to these two terms, something that can be viewed as an error, as a negligible error term. So epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 have to go to 0 as x, y converges to x, 0, y, 0. So that's the condition. OK, so in fact, I could stop here. But I want to explain the notation again, because I think all of this sounds great until you encounter the notation, and then it becomes a little bit, it, it could become a little bit confusing. But now we can very easily unravel the notation as well, because we now have a very good ex uh, example of that in the one-dimensional case. So here's how the notation works for this. Just as in a one-dimensional case, I will have dx. But to really, do, to really do justice to dx, I have to keep track of the reference point, which now is x0, y0. And so dx is x minus x0. There is also dy, which is y minus y0. And there is, there is also dz or df, or df. which is z minus z0. So this formula, which I, put, which I have framed, can be written as df equals f sub x dx plus f sub y dy. More precisely, you have to put everywhere x0, y0, here x0, y0, here x0, y0, here x0, y0, and here x0, y0. And if you do that, and you remember what this means, this will be identical. This will become identical to this. Right? It's nothing more, nothing less. But, in, a, uh, in other words, this formula makes sense for a given reference point x0, y0, and it's nothing but the equation for the tangent plane. But after this, just to simplify the formulas, you kind of, you, you, you draw up all the indices. You say, okay, let's just forget about this. Let's forget, not forget, let's remember it, but let's not write it on the board, or let's not write it on a piece of paper. So the formula really becomes just df equals fx dx plus fy dy. So if on the homework, if on the homework you're asked to, write, to compute the differential of a function, that's what you're going to do. You're going to take the first, um, the first partial derivative times dx plus the second partial derivative times dy. So it's just uh, nothing could be e easier than that. You just take two partial derivatives, right? But what time is it? Oh, it's five. OK. But now I have explained to you what the meaning of this formula is. All right? So we'll, uh, we'll talk about it more during the review on Tuesday. <laughs>